Hi, this is Julie Chineda. I'm a fantasy and science fiction author published by Daw Books, and I'm here today to talk to you about world building in a way you might not have expected. So I, I, I you don't have to do what I did to uh, prepare for my book, A Turn of Light, but I'd like to tell you a little bit about it just in case, hey, it might work for you, and we like to share our ideas. So as you can see, this is the cover of the book, but long before there was a book, there was the model building. And that was just one of those uh, decisions I made in part because I'd never written fantasy before and I wanted a landscape. I wanted a really rich, wonderful landscape. So I do think this is an unusual way to start with a lot of polystyrene. Um, <laughs> the first thing I did was decide on the scale. I wanted to do the, va the valley and the village where all the action in the book takes place. So what I did was I just determined the amount of food that was needed to feed the 26 people of my village, the acreage that would be required to grow, say, barley in the northern hemisphere. And that gave me the acres I had to fit. And then I had this handy piece of board that I was going to use. So that gave me my outside scale. So the model was going to be one centimeter equals 20 meters. And that gave me my starting point, which was fine. This is the valley. The valley, however, is a little vertically distorted, as you may notice. So I went in and I tore things apart. Uh, I will say if you decide to use polystyrene, this is just the insulation you can buy at any uh, uh, Home Depot or that kind of, we just happen to have some extra lying around. When you do work with it, if you use heat, it will gas out in an unpleasant manner, formaldehydes release, that sort of thing. So I didn't do that. I just used regular glue to glue it together. And if you've ever made a contour map, that's how I did this. I actually um, sketched out the valley as I thought it would be with some mountains and other parts. And then I carved it down. And that's what I used. I used a knife and I used a file and I just kept chipping away at it until it became something. I wasn't sure quite what. So here's where we go. So one of the things that happened shortly into here was I ended up with smooth shapes that I hadn't expected. And I haven't written a thing and I had no idea where the book was going to go, but I wanted something coming up from the magical realm. And I thought, these smooth things, and they look a bit like bone. So I like them. So you can see them reaching out, almost like fingers that have come in and clawed out this valley. So already I'm immersing myself in the story, though I haven't written a word yet. The coloring you see is me deciding on the, the bottom textures, uh, where there'll be a river, where there'll be a floodplain, that kind of thing. So here you go. And, and I these little things you see tossed in there, those are my little village buildings, just so I have an idea of the scale of those as well. And my husband, Roger, who was a wonderful help, uh, actually gave me his beautiful workshop and his Dremel so I could continue making great inroads into the models. So this is him teaching me, and this is me taking over the workshop for days, 28 days exactly. So that's how it looked after I finished carving away. And then I started sanding. It looks a bit more uh, like a landscape now, doesn't it? As opposed to polystyrene just stacked up. And I was having way too much fun. It's important to have fun. So now I've got these smooth bony shapes coming out and then I had a big accident uh, I leaned on it when I shouldn't have and a whole portion of this broke off that I didn't expect would do so I thought what can I do with that so what I ended up doing was making a hidden passage which became an important part of the story writers use everything so here it's now pretty well taking shape and if you recognize the red lid to the side, you'll know that spackle, uh, which is the stuff you use to fill holes in the walls. I used it to fill the gaps that I didn't need or want in the model. So I'll just show you a couple of examples of excellent spackling technique. It dries white, don't worry. And just a few places where I didn't have, uh, you know, you could see the joins between the two pieces of the polystyrene. So here, you, here it is again. And it's really starting to uh, 
it'd be a bit evocative. I was, you know, getting a little bit more excited all the time. And then, of course, one vacuums one's work uh, outside. I actually blew it rather than vacuum because when you sand polystyrene, there's bits. And when you sand the spackle, there's more bits. So there it is. And I almost wanted to leave it there because it was looking really great. That, no, I couldn't do that. I had to start painting. This was the scariest thing I've ever done was to actually, after all these days of work, start spray painting it. But then I saw what was happening and it was pretty cool. This is just the first coat. And that's after, that's another first coat. But then this is what it, just one more coat. And that's just Krylon. So you just, uh, this, you can buy it at any uh, hobby shop or uh, home improvement shop. It's a, a great paint and it comes happily enough in a sort of a base dirt color. So from then on, I just had to move up. But doesn't it look amazing now? I'm still excited when I see this. Then it was time to paint. Um, I do dabble in painting. Uh, so I did have a selection of um, acrylic paints. These are just like watercolor paints uh, in that I would use. And I, I just started with the green, the darkest green. And what I'm painting here is I'm actually painting the rivers. So I wanted that sort of oozy green feeling in the background. For those who don't know me, my background is in uh, freshwater biology. So it meant a lot to me to have some slime. So there you see the rivers coming in. Now getting some blue and having way too much fun. But as you can see, I've started painting those eruptions, those fingers I talked about. I began calling them the bone hills and I worked very hard to mix a color that was sort of like aging bone. How fun is that? And here I am finishing the river. So there you go. So I've done the white of the bone hills and I've done the rivers to this point. And it's starting to look like something. Now it was time to get the village going and the great greenery going. So you can see now what I mean when I said I was designed it to fit the number of acres of barley that they would have to grow. They don't grow barley trust me, but they grow something similar. So these fields would be uh, fields of grain. And here you see me actually painting now the grain color because it's going to start taking place in the fall or just at end of summer. And I've also started adding some rapids to the water courses. And there you go. At this point, I'd be getting to really worry about the fact that the green and the, and the brown didn't really look very realistic, but I thought, patience, patience. And now I'm drawing the details of the village itself, the village of Meridale, where everybody lives, where everything takes place. There's one road in, and you can see that taking shape up at the top. And here's another perspective of where the village is. And if you look at the bottom of the picture, you'll see there's a a little tiny farm down there that seems very cut off from the others. And, and of course, that's where you might find a dragon. I love my job. So now I've put in buildings. I worked out the scale. I went to visit mills and uh, did my best. It's starting to actually look like a thing, isn't it? I was really pleased with this. The other thing I wanted was I wanted to know what a visitor would see when they first entered Meridale. That moment is important. So I could actually now bend down and I could look down the road and I could see which buildings they could see first. I would see what of the panorama they would see. And it really informed my ability to describe it and gave me a lot of fun. I basically took over the entire dining room. So now I'm starting to stick stuff on. What I did was um, they, for anyone who's in modeling, you can buy flock, they call it, in different colors. And so I just stuck some flock of uh, the color of my grain into a spice jar, and then I just shook it onto glue. And the glue that I used was just the podgy kind of stuff. It, it dries. Um, it goes on white and then it dries clear. And it's, it's great for this kind of project. You've got a lot of uh, forgiving time with it. So this is all now actually fiber 
on top of the model. And then I started making trees. Again, I just took this kind of material that you can get and then you just pull off a little bit and then you just roll it around with a little bit of glue and then just plop it. There was a lot of plopping. And now I'm starting to go up into the hills. I'm, I'm in, these would be kind of, uh, like fir trees and that kind of thing. But the beauty is at this scale, as long as it looks green and lush, you could be pretty well convinced it's a forest. And then for more uh, deciduous trees, I just roll the, the, the glue and the flock in a little ball and just boop, popped it down. It's a lot easier than writing, let me tell you. So here you go. Now you can see what I see, saw when I was writing this story. So there's the village. There's the bones. There's that mysterious path up that I, did, I created because I'd actually broken something, but it became a big part of the story. And here's another view. I have, um, I also wanted to think bigger. When you're writing a story, you, you don't want the world, yes, you want it, a space you can write about, but you want that hint of more, of something waiting beyond. So to me, that was this area here where you see the three kind of grabby fingers going out, but it looks like there's something going on back there as if maybe there's a bit of a ruin or a tower or something there. So, which could be. And now you can sort of get an, a view from the other side. So I actually did, in order to create the illusion that something reached out and grabbed at the world, I actually used my fingers and I grabbed at the polystyrene and pulled it. So the lines that go out from those white things actually dig into the, uh, the, the hills on either side. The other thing I did was, when you make a model out of flock and fluffy things and paint, it's fragile. And also it could get not only dusty, but things could fall off. So what I did was I'd, I'd read this on a, uh, a people that make train miniatures and landscapes. I just took a, a, the jar of podgy and I just poured it. I poured it over everything. I hoped that this would happen. If you can see the rivers now sparkle because the podgy, which it looked horrible. It was all white and horrible mess, but it, it dried clear and it left the shiny areas shiny. So the water looks far more convincing now. And all the trees and all the other parts were uh, pretty well invulnerable to any kind of being dusty. Then, then Roger came back in and said, you did such a good job. I'm gonna make you a fancy base with legs. And I'm gonna make, uh, which he did. And then he made, you know, we got nice little plaques and the scales on it. And there it is. And he even made a case, which was really nice. And you might wonder, what did I do with it then? Well, one of the important things in the story is that everything looks ordinary until sunset. And at sunset, as the sun passes across, things change in that moment. So you see that toads have teeth. You see that what are horses are not horses. You see the things, what you think are leaves in the trees suddenly can dance and fly and are carrying spears. And only in that moment, a sunset passes. So from the corner that you see to your, well, on me, for me, it's to the, to the right where the village is, the sun rises there and then it sets at the other end. And that's called night's edge as that sunset goes through. So you can see why I was very, very important. And what I did was I actually had, a, had this in front of my desk while I was writing and I would actually move the light so I would see exactly where all these things would happen. So yeah, so that's, that's basically how I created uh, the model. It was exhibited to my great joy to 2012 at uh, World Fantasy in Toronto, which was <laughs> never done that before either. So yeah, it, it's, it's a project that gave me a huge, huge step towards my book. And when I sat down to write, it just flowed. It took three years of flowing because it's a big book and I had to learn how to write fantasy as well as I wanted to. But the model was intrinsic to it and it always gave me confidence. And now that I'm writing more in that series, I now always will have Meridel. I may not make too many more other models, but I might.
Thank you very much for listening to the presentation. There's going to be an opportunity to ask me questions, I believe. Uh, so I look forward to what you might want to know. Thank you.